Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos on the philosophy of Ted Kuczynski in the sixth and final lecture over the so-called Unabomber Manifesto, Industrial Society and Its Future. We will finish the paragraph by paragraph level reader's guide to the text uh, by talking now about the section of the text which is uh, titled The Danger of Leftism. We could call that The Danger of Leftoidism in line with the definition of that you saw in my eighth book, Leftoid Psychology. And speaking of books, now that we are finishing this group reading, I want to announce that all of this discussion will be collected and then um, greatly added onto uh, into a new book called The a Technological Crisis, A Reader's Guide to the Unabomber Manifesto of Tate Kaczynski. So once again, taking all this discussion that has gone on uh, kind of on an off and on basis over the past two years on the channel, but add to it significantly by also showing you a holistic picture of how Ted Kaczynski's thought has evolved um, in line with these particular topics, going all the way back to his early unpublished essays on technology from the 1970s, the uh, letters from prison, uh, the published works like Anti-Tech Revolution, Why and How, and all of this, by the way, will also be discussed on the channel. There will be videos on those particular unpublished essays, letters, we'll be revisiting Anti-Tech Revolution, Why and How, really my New Year's resolution for this year is to go back to discussing the anti-technological thinkers like Kaczynski, Elul, Evola, etc., uh, which admittedly did not get enough attention on the channel last year as we were talking about things like grammar and language, which is, of course, also very important. But uh, my New Year's resolution, once again, is to spend a lot more time with uh, that anti-technological material, which is so important. So I also want to begin with the disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes alone. The purpose of this video is neither to promote nor to refute any theories but rather to examine them from a strictly philosophical perspective. Also, if you are interested in supporting the channel, links to my Patreon and subscribe to our accounts in the video description. So if we get into the text itself, we find in paragraph 213 that Kaczynski warns the reader that leftists often become attracted to movements that are not originally leftist in nature. This is simply because they perceive that such movements are vaguely rebellious and therefore might provide them another excuse to publicly vent their rage about some other grievance du jour. After this initial infection by one leftist occurs, however, that movement proceeds to get overwhelmed with a stampede of so many other leftists who follow their influencers like so many lemmings and then subtly transform that movement into something very different from what it was originally supposed to be. Kaczynski therefore strongly cautions the reader to never allow the same fate to befall the anti-technological movement, because this would provide the single most efficient means of undoing all of the hard work which Kaczynski put into formulating a crystal clear and logically bulletproof anti-technological philosophy, let alone any viable plan to thwart the human race away from the doomed trajectory of technological overshoot which is currently stuck on. While the casual reader might have the knee-jerk reaction of explaining away all of this is nothing more than Kaczynski's supposed and ultimately non-existent conservative bias, we should unpack why exactly it is that going mainstream within the SJW movement would be the single worst thing which could happen to the anti-technological movement. Now, first of all, we must recall that Kaczynski clarified near the very beginning of the manifesto that leftism is not to be equated with any particular ideology because as a psychological type, leftism is quite literally pre-ideological. According to Kaczynski, leftism is primarily defined as the coincidence of a pair of psychological traits called over-socialization and feelings of inferiority. To put it very briefly, over-socialization is an excessive tendency to do exactly what societal expectations require one to do, while feelings of inferiority refer to a tendency to project one's resentment over one's powerlessness and lack of agency onto any available outlet of socially acceptable aggression. Needless to say, these two traits would be problematic in any historical era, but under the domination of modern technology, the leftist traits come to be accelerated by conditions that are basically hardwired to turn 
all of the humans living under modern technology into something like the leftist psychological type. This is because modern technology requires excessive over-socialization in the form of uh, fully regulating people's behavior. It has to do this in order to maximize the predictability and efficiency of the system as a whole. This, in turn, generates even more feelings of inferiority by actually making people as powerless as the leftist feels himself to be in their ressentiment against those who have the agency which they feel themselves to lack. In a post-arrest essay called The System's Neatest Trick, Kaczynski noted that because modern technology contradicts hundreds of thousands of years of hunter-gatherer evolutionary conditions, people will always already feel on a subconscious level that they want to rebel against something, even if they have no idea what that something is. But the system cleverly works two steps ahead of itself by allowing them to act out on these rebellious impulses by openly encouraging them to fight against certain things which the system just happened to already need to get out of the way by tricking them into um, increasing the system's technological efficiency by pushing through some much-needed updates. A very good example of this is that the system has no problem with SJWs taking to the streets to fight for things like racial equality or gender equality because the system needs human cogs to come from every ethnic background and every gender identity. All 68 of them are fine because the system would find it to be a problem if anybody could not be incorporated into the vast pseudo-organism of economic production as workers and consumers. If only half the population were allowed to fill that role, as might have been the case at uh, the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when it was mostly just men who took jobs in factories while women stayed at home and cared for the family, this would indeed be a technical problem, because it would inhibit the system from advancing itself as a self-propagating system, which we know from the purified laws of them as presented with an anti-tech revolution, why and how, um, is always in pursuit of the largest possible scope of operation. Likewise, we find that the person who is hardwired to exhibit these two leftist psychological traits will only later come to espouse any number of different ideological contents, because the latter are valued far more for their ability to provide an outlet for these negative psychological drives than for their semantic meaningfulness as ideologies in the proper sense of the term. You have probably already noticed that SGWs have virtually no limit on how many different causes they can incorporate onto a laundry list of grievances, which they understand on one hand they're required to pay lip service to in public in order to remain in good standing with the rest of the herd, but they understand on the other that they don't have to actually know what they're talking about when they do so. Proof that any one of these ideologies is nothing more than a means to an end to allow the SJW to publicly vent his or her frustration can be found in the way that many of these items on the laundry list flatly contradict one another, but the contradiction goes unnoticed because the list contains so many dozens of other items that one never feels the need to concern oneself with any one of them unless one has been prompted to by the media. One only really thinks about the issues which are trending in the news or in one's social media that particular day. A few examples of such contradictions that go unnoticed include the following. SJWs realize that they have to support environmentalism, which is supposed to mean saving nature. They also realize that they're supposed to support um, unlimited technological progress, which means the destruction of nature. They don't realize that progress in technology requires things like pollution, or habitat destruction, or resource depletion, or just the regulation of everything within nature, for this is the only way that the global technological system can maximize the things it really needs, like predictability, efficiency, and productivity. But of course, SGWs don't really think about environmentalism unless the media tells them to on the days when it happens to get a tip from so-called clean energy companies in China that they need to run a news story promoting solar panels or wind turbines to artificially bid up the stock value of these same companies. If that is not the case on that particular day, SJWs don't even remember that they're supposed to care about saving nature. 
Similarly, back when the Iran nuclear deal was trending in the news because a Democrat president needed to um, raise his approval rating by pretending to be single-handedly delivering world peace, SJWs also favored portraying a strict religious theocracy in which homosexuals are put to death as being fully consistent with the leftist movement and its values. Then turn around the very next day when something else is trending in the news and use these same social media accounts to promote things like transgenderism, homosexuality, polyamory, and the public school grooming of children, without realizing that these same things would all be harshly criminalized under the same religious theocracy they had just claimed one day earlier had been granted full membership within the SGW movement. More recently, last year in 2022, when gas prices got high enough to start impacting another Democrat president's approval rating, Transportation Secretary Pete Booty Judge showed an even more impressive display of leftist cognitive dissonance when he assured the public that the solution to the combined problems of petroleum shortage and global warming could be as simple as removing the barriers to start importing oil from Iran and Venezuela. This is because, apparently, Mother Nature herself cares enough about nations' political affiliations that she only causes carbon emissions to exist if the oil in question originated in a capitalist nation. But she'll suspend these same laws of physics if that oil came from a communist dictatorship or from a strict religious theocracy in the Middle East. But Buttigieg so easily combined the self-contradictory motifs of a politically motivated desire to keep gas prices low until the midterms, um, combined with pseudo-environmentalist concern over drilling on federal lands and climate change, and then combined both of these with the understanding that communism and Sharia law are currently more trendy among SJWs than capitalism. But in doing so, he only showed that all of these motifs could be so easily shoved into a single monstrous composite image because, as an SJW, he didn't really have to understand what any one of them meant. There really is no need to think about any item on the laundry list of leftist grievances, because the whole point is just to find some available outlet to whine about something on that particular day. But the deeper question, which few ask, is where exactly does this constant need to whine come from in the first place? Well, ironically, the only thing which is never allowed to be added onto the laundry list of leftist grievances is the one thing which all of them really provide a mask for, and that one thing is one's suffering under the domination of modern technology. Now, a perceptive reader might very well ask at this point, isn't Kaczynski's warning in paragraph 213 to never let a leftist rebellion against technology become a thing, isn't it therefore just wasted breath, since he would seem to be warning about something which can't happen because it's impossible? Well, here we have to be very careful with our words. The irony here is that even if it did somehow become fashionable among leftoids to pay lip service to opposing technology, they still would not really be talking about technology in the sense that Kaczynski uses the term. If one is skeptical of this, one should be reminded that we can already see concretely the way that this works in the example of how it has already become fashionable for SJWs to publicly oppose things like fossil fuel companies, or to uh, voice an environmentalist concern for trying to save nature. In both cases, they somehow miss the point twice as much, precisely through seizing the surface-level linguistification, which actually does identify the right issue on a superficial level. They realize, though, that they don't have to go any deeper than the layer of pre-digested linguistifications which the global technological system had already fed to them, and which it had only done so as part of the system's neatest trick. To be more specific, the leftist critique of technology, if that ever did exist, certainly would not cause one to realize that one had to oppose the very subtle things about modern technology and how it functions. Things like modern technology's monopoly over the ability to go through the power process for really serious things like the production of food or um, the uh, securing of drinkable water. Another thing about modern technology which the leftist critique thereof would never identify is that it is this lack of freedom 
Under modern conditions, as a result of this monopoly over serious iterations through the power process, which generates the need to be an SGW in the first place, for the need to find something to complain about that day would theoretically disappear if one could just get one's freedom back and concern oneself with real iterations through the power process instead of these superficial surrogate activities. No, these truths about what technology really is and how it really functions hit far too close to home to ever be allowed, let alone openly encouraged by the system through its neatest trick. Likewise, in paragraph 214, Kaczynski noted that any movement that really is in favor of nature must, by extension, be opposed to technology, for these are two different ways of saying exactly the same thing. But for this very reason, it must also avoid collaborating with leftists. This is once again not for any ideological reason, for as we've already shown, leftism is inherently pre-ideological. Instead, Kaczynski issued this warning because the psychological traits which define leftism are incompatible with any attempt to negate modern technology because modern technology is directly required to achieve any of the kinds of goals which leftists favor. Great example of this is that leftists require collectivization. Collectivization is necessary because of the leftists' conflicted need to remain fully regulated by the over-socialization of societal norms, which precludes him or her from performing any really independently chosen action, combined with a hardwired need to go through the power process, which really is just a part of our human nature, and therefore lingers on despite any amount of over-socialization, and actually becomes even more pathologically frustrated as a result of this chronic technological repression. These two contradictory needs can only find compromise through allowing the leftists to identify with some large collectivist movement, for the latter allows one to vicariously feel like one has an opportunity to establish a goal and then expend effort towards it and then finally achieve that goal, even if all of this is just an elaborate illusion. For example, you might remember that when the Supreme Court ruled in favor of same-sex marriage in 2015, all of the SGWs in America publicly celebrated this decision as somehow being their own victory. They flew the rainbow flag on their profile pictures on FaceMash for one day without realizing that not a single one of them as individuals had actually done anything that day to make this happen. It's not an exaggeration to call this a purely virtual iteration through the power process, in which one is allowed to feel like one has performed not just any act, but a globe-spanning one which is capable of changing the very trajectory of world history for all time, when in reality one has remained completely passive that day and is only watched from afar as the global technological system itself implemented the exact same change which it had already decided would be beneficial for its technical functioning. Because of the totally illusory nature of this virtual power process, the SJW's satisfaction from watching its collective win is necessarily incomplete, and it's so short-lived that one will always feel the need to repeat the surrogate activity over and over again, but with a seemingly larger scale change pursued each time. A second goal of the leftist that directly requires modern technology is the regulation of behavior. Even for seemingly beneficent purposes like, say, promoting tolerance, you might have already noticed that the real reason why leftoids are obsessed with promoting quote-unquote tolerance is simply because tolerance under this definition is nothing more than a euphemism for mind control. As Slavoj Žižek noted in his 2014 book, Absolute Recoil, political correctness really does differ from previous attempts to control speech because in modernity it's no longer good enough to just make sure that people don't publicly say bad things about others on the basis of race, gender, sexual orientation, etc. No, the SGW has to reach all the way down onto the inside of people's minds to make sure that they aren't also silently thinking bad thoughts about other people on the basis of their race, gender, sexual orientation, etc. And they have to make sure that this isn't happening even on an unconscious level. This might sound like hyperbole, but you might recall that there actually was a ridiculous news article in late 2014 supporting the leftist violence of the Ferguson riots by 
telling the reader that it was justified by the fact that, look, we might as well admit that we're all pretty much racist, even if you don't intend to be, because your subconscious prejudices, according to this author, are always silently predisposing you to harbor negative stereotypical views about others, even if you don't realize that this was happening until this self-righteous asshole in the media notified you that that was the case. It should be clear to anyone familiar with Kaczynski and or Ellulian critiques of technology, though, that all of this really is just a euphemism for saying that it's no longer enough for traditional over-socialization techniques such as parenting or schooling or religious indoctrination to teach children what is and is not appropriate to say in public and then leave it at that. No, under modern conditions, we also need to go below the surface level of thinking in order to regulate the deepest subconscious layers of the mind, which in a post-Freudian world that no longer believes in things like psychoanalysis, um, can only mean that the system requires super-specialized psychological techniques to condition the brain to act in certain coerced ways, which in turn presupposes that a very sophisticated scientific modeling of how the brain functions as a biological machine must be developed and must be constantly improved upon. Lest the viewer make the mistake of thinking that Kaczynski was skeptical of this project's feasibility, one should recall that he explicitly mentioned in some letters from prison and also in a short unpublished essay from the early 1970s titled Progress vs. Liberty, that these scientific attempts to crack the code regarding how the brain functions as an extremely complicated biological machine could one day, in theory, succeed in fully liquidating all of the brain's secrets. However, the fact that this is theoretically possible is not proof that humans are uniquely intelligent and therefore indispensable to the system. No, on the contrary, if this ever were accomplished, it would only guarantee that the very possibility of human freedom would vanish forever, as the human person would then be permanently reduced to the status of nothing more than a fully replicable and fully manipulable electrical appliance. It also bears mentioning that because the ceiling for robotic capabilities is intrinsically so much higher than the ceiling for human abilities, because the latter are constrained by natural limits which the former are free from, giving the global technological system the blueprints for every detail regarding how the human brain works will inevitably allow the system to build an improved robotic model on top of that foundation which it had plagiarized from nature. This, in turn, will guarantee human extinction as a result of destroying any possibility for humans to justify their existence on the basis of their talents, skills, or knowledge, because the robotic upgrade built on top of this plagiarized foundation would include everything which nature gave us, plus so many other improvements which are fundamentally inaccessible to us. Leftists need to regulate human behavior through conditioning the brain to adopt the right views on an involuntary and subconscious level, therefore is only superficially a means to an end to advance goals like ridding society of racism, sexism, homophobia, etc. For in reality, all of these humanistic chimeras are completely irrelevant to the long-term goal of making human beings themselves technologically obsolete and then allowing the technological system to delete the entire species as irrelevant. Very interestingly, in paragraph 215, Kaczynski notes that leftists strive for power, which in turn causes them to be fully dependent on modern technology, is strangely to be contrasted with the anarchists' drive for power. This is because the anarchist's drive for power is exactly what makes the anarchist have to oppose modern technology. Now, a perceptive reader will throw up their hands at this point and ask, how on earth can we make sense of this apparent contradiction in which the drive for power is a good thing in one case and a bad thing in another? Well, there's a certain ambiguity here with regard to the word power itself, which we have to unpack. Kaczynski noted all the way back in paragraph 33 that the need to go through the power process really is a universal of human nature because it is quote-unquote probably based in biology. In other words, this need for the power process is a natural instinct but this pre-givenness of 
it as an instinct leads it to later be construed in one of two directions depending on the individual. On one hand, this instinct can be construed empirically and concretely through the harmful technological mode of the leftist, which will drive the leftist to sign a deal with the devil of modern technology which ensures human extinction in the long term, in exchange for the satisfaction of vicarious pleasure through watching one's collective movement rack up one political victory after another in the short term. On the other hand, the same instinct for power can be construed naturally by the anarchist, in which case one will be willing to risk everything to oppose the globe-scanning technological system simply because one loves freedom. And one loves freedom in the precise sense of the ability to go through the power process to satisfy serious needs without any interference from the global technological system over how one will do so. In paragraph 216, Kaczynski warns that timing is very sensitive when judging leftists' supposed opposition to any given thing. For example, in the academic industry, leftist professors passionately defend defended freedom of speech back in the days when they were still a minority who were fighting for their own right to espouse unconventional views by the standards of that time. But as soon as leftists became the numerical majority, now representing well over 90% of professors in some departments, they quickly changed their mind about this freedom of speech thing by instead shifting gears to talking about this other new thing called political correctness, which is the idea that we can't allow a fully unbridled freedom of speech in the academic industry because that might allow someone to say something which is perceived to be offensive or intolerant by an arbitrary and ever-changing standard which, of course, only the leftist professors themselves get to determine. In the years since the manifesto was written, a new term has come to be favored by leftoids to justify taking away freedom of speech not just for a handful of academic careerists in the ivory tower, but for the whole global population of internet users. This term is, of course, misinformation, which might as well be seen as the technological upgrade over political correctness. Because this policing of misinformation allows the leftoids to regulate a far larger number of people, but to do so on a continuous, ongoing, and fully automated basis through having Silicon Valley robots constantly screen everyone's social media activity and then ban any users found to be problematic on arbitrary partisan grounds. So too, Kaczynski warns that even if leftists claim to oppose technology in the short term, while they're still in the minority which is perceived to be in opposition to the broader technological system, as soon as they seize mainstream power over that same system, they will do exactly the same thing which they've always done. Or to use a simile from The Lord of the Rings, expecting them to destroy modern technology at the same moment they seize control of the global technological system and all of its power, would be like expecting Schmeagel to destroy the ring after finally getting it back on his finger after so many years of chasing it. Neither of these could realistically happen, because that would amount to asking them to use their newfound power for the sole purpose of destroying their newfound power. This is something which is especially unlikely to occur for someone whose over-socialization and feelings of inferiority make it impossible for them to go through the power process as an individual. In paragraph 217, Kaczynski warns that this would not be the first time in history that leftists will have temporarily allied themselves with non-leftist revolutionaries only to throw them and their causes under the bus immediately after seizing power. You only have to look at the French, Russian, Spanish, and Cuban revolutions to find more than enough concrete empirical evidence of how this has worked in the past. However, this would be even more likely to happen in the case of a revolution against technology because in none of the previously cited examples did a critique of modern technology play any role in the revolution. These were instead conducted against comparatively irrelevant humanistic concerns like uh, capitalism, the monarchy, the Catholic Church, etc., but in a future revolution in which modern technology itself would be the issue. This would also be the one thing which the leftists could never get rid of without also losing their sole source of vicarious power. 
In paragraph 218, Kaczynski goes as far as to call leftism a religion, despite the obvious fact that it lacks, and in some cases has an explicit aversion to any supernatural beliefs. This lack of supernatural belief, however, is totally irrelevant to leftism status as a religion because, on a psychological level, leftism plays the exact same role that religion does for the true believer. You might recall that Nietzsche's critique of Christianity in the 19th century really was just a critique of these same two psychological traits, rather than really be a critique of the ideas of the first century AD figure Jesus of Nazareth as such. It's because at the particular moment in European history in which Nietzsche lived, the psychological traits of over-socialization and feelings of inferiority tended to find their socially acceptable outlet in the cultural figure of the outwardly pious religious conformist. This was a person who could fall back on blaming their ressentiment over their lack of personal agency on their ethical duty to strictly adhere to a set of moralistic prohibitions. This is what explained their inability to act freely while really just covering over their nihilism or their negative will to power which wills nothing simply because it is too weak to affirm its own values. It should be obvious, though, that Nietzsche's critique of Christianity is totally out of date today because in the 21st century West, the exact same role is now ironically filled by the anti-Christian, secularist zealots in the SJW movement, and they've turned this hatred for traditional religious morality into a perverse kind of religious morality in itself. We know that the same underlying psychological mechanisms are at work in both cases because in both cases, it is not enough to just privately believe in one's own moral code and then follow it on an individual level while minding one's own business. No, the moral zealot in both cases has a duty to impose these morals on everyone else while probably violating them oneself. This is because the values are, as Kaczynski says himself, quote-unquote, right with a capital R, or something which has to be believed in, despite being contradicted by inconvenient things like logic or facts. This cognitive dissonance can be sustained to an extreme level, though, only because of the quote-unquote vital role which this right with a capital R plays in one's psychological economy, to use the term favored by Kaczynski himself. We can interpret this to mean that the only purpose of the absolute right with a capital R is to anchor the human subject in a firm belief that his or her current suffering and feelings of powerlessness will someday be resolved by the promise of being granted the ultimate outlet for one's freedom. Whereas for the 19th century Christian, this promise took the form of a supernatural belief in a heavenly reward in the afterlife, which could survive a lot of cognitive dissonance because there was no need to prove it conclusively in this life. For the secular uh, leftist, however, this promise of salvation falls squarely on technological progress and has to be delivered upon within the realm of material reality and within historical temporality. This inconvenient in fact that the technological system continually creates more problems than it solves by making its human inmates less free with each new innovation ironically strengthens this belief in the short term because worsening conditions make the leftist even more desperate for some big payoff someday in a future that won't actually arrive. In paragraph 219, Kaczynski warns that leftism is necessarily a totalitarian force for exactly the same reason that modern technology is a totalitarian force itself. In both cases, any element which is found to still lie outside the scope of the collective movement is given only two choices. It can either be coerced into joining, or it must be eliminated outright. This is the essence of leftism because it is the essence of modern technology. And this is because the former simply is the humanization of the latter. We could find confirmation of this in the way that Kaczynski explicitly warns at this point in the text that the leftist will forever remain unsatisfied no matter how many political victories he or she racks up is because, quote-unquote, the leftist's real motive is not to attain the ostensible goals of leftism. In reality, he is motivated by the sense of power 
he gets from struggling for and then reaching a social goal, end quote. This is why there really is no such thing as ever reaching a point where the leftist finally throws up their hands and say, okay, that's enough. I've finally gotten enough political victories, and now I can lay the game of political activism to rest and go on and do something else with the rest of my life. This is something which the leftist can't ever do for just the same reason that modern technology is incapable of ever being satisfied with having taken away enough from nature or from our freedom. The reason for this should be quite clear. Leftists are quite literally human embodiments of modern technology. So the rules of self-propagating systems, which really don't make room for any such thing as an ending point where the game can stop, um, it should apply to both of them equally. In paragraph 220, we find that even if you gave a leftist a notebook and then asked them to just make a super long list of every single problem in society which they want solved, even if you gave them this blank check and then had a genie magically appear and grant the wish to have every one of these problems solved tomorrow, the leftist would still find something to complain about. In fact, the leftist would maybe take a few days to try to find something else, but as soon as they did, they would go back to the game. This is because the point, once again, is not to solve any one of the problems they claim to be so passionate about. Rather, the problem is to find a problem. You could just imagine that professional SGWs like Anna Kasparian of the Young Turks wake up first thing every morning and immediately grab their smartphones to begin the daily ritual of scrolling down the news feed, desperately trying to find something that they will be allowed by the media and Democrat Party to complain about that day. They already know that they want to vent their anger in a socially acceptable manner about something, even before they know what that something will get to be that day. But the real reason for this pathological need to find something, anything to be angry about, is that modern technology has already made them angry about its constant and ongoing destruction of their freedom. In paragraph 221, we find once again that over-socialization's hyper-regulation of the leftist's behavior precludes any kind of autonomous action except for the one morally acceptable outlet, to use Kaczynski's term, and that is, quote-unquote, the struggle to impose their morality on everyone. This is a really, really strange kind of surrogate activity, if you think about it, because it turns the moral prohibition against action into a perverse kind of action in itself. This proves that modern technology takes away so much of our freedom that we will eventually become so desperate to seize any opportunity to feel like we have something to work on, that we will turn the prohibition against action itself into the only action we're allowed to perform. In paragraph 222, we learn that no one can be a viable candidate to join the anti-technological movement unless his or her sole commitment is opposition to technology. But now we know the exact reason why. If any other issue were allowed onto that list, even just one other issue, that would immediately compromise the member of the movement because it goes without saying that technology would be required to solve the problem represented by that second issue. You would have to use technology to... Um, solve the goal represented by that other issue because technology itself is defined in a certain sense as usefulness. In Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, he doesn't really use the word technology even in the section of the text dedicated to it. Instead, Hegel simply calls it utility. This, however, is in itself something of an illusion, for Kaczynski notes that we can only see that technology isn't in itself usefulness for us and for our political goals if we realize that the true character of technology is that it is a self-propagating system which only temporarily values us and only so long as we're useful in allowing it to advance its drive to maximizing its scope of operations. The irony here is that the thing which Hegel defined as utility only allows us to exist so long as we remain useful to it. In paragraph 223, we find a humorous hypothetical voice raise the objection, quote unquote, This stuff about leftism is a lot of crap. I know John and Jane who are leftish types, 
and they're perfectly nice people. Well, this misses the point that leftism for Kaczynski is not an ideology, we've already established that, but it's also not any group of human individuals as such. Leftism for Kaczynski is instead simply a morphological essence defined by the two psychological traits of over-socialization and feelings of inferiority. It's completely irrelevant, then, to single out any particular human instantiation of that type and then ask the mundane empirical question of whether that person is nice or not. The question is not whether any one individual leftist is a mean person. The question is whether leftism's psychological traits enjoy a perfect symmetrical accord with the defining features of modern technology as a self-propagating system oriented towards negating nature in favor of maximizing its own efficiency and predictability? Well, the answer to that is a clear and resounding yes. In paragraphs 224 to 26, we find that it doesn't even matter if a numerical majority of leftists are nice people. It won't matter because the laws of natural selection dictate that those types won't be the ones who will become the leaders of the movement. Instead, the ones who will claw their way to positions of power at the very top will be the most power-hungry types. But ironically, what this really means is that these will be the types who will have the most frustrated relation to power precisely because they will be the ones who suffer the most under artificially induced conditions of powerlessness through their over-socialization under modern technology. As a result, these ruthless leaders who are angry because they are made even more resentfully powerless under the domination of modern technology will ironically do everything the technological system requires it, um, them to do, whereas the nicer types will refuse to condemn the decisions of their ruthless leaders because of their religious need to believe in the movement as being right with a capital R. This recipe for disaster, in which the ruthless types will push the bar much further than the nicer types will, but will never be called out for it for religious reasons in the proper sense of the term, well, you could see where this is going to lead in the long run, and that is human extinction. Paragraph 225 provides examples of how this already has worked in the past, as leftoids have consistently refused to condemn the communist Soviet Union when it engaged in imperialist invasions, even though it leapt at every opportunity to condemn capitalist America for doing the same thing. Well, paragraph 226, we learn that this only proves that leftism as a whole can take on a totalitarian form, even if the numerical majority of its human members are not really totalitarian as individuals. In paragraph 227, Kaczynski admits that, quote-unquote, our discussion of leftism has a serious weakness. This is the impossibility of defining the term leftist any more clearly than the two psychological traits listed near the beginning of the text had done. Now, in my own opinion, what Kaczynski seems to be saying here is that many readers will disagree with him and nitpick whether a given movement is or is not leftist on ideological grounds without realizing that uh, Kaczynski's definition of leftism has nothing to do with ideology. As I've mentioned many times before, for Kaczynski, leftism is simply a psychological type defined by these two traits of over-socialization and feelings of inferiority, and is therefore inherently pre-ideological. In fact, it can espouse any number of different surface-level contents because it only has to do so after the fact and only as a means to an end to advance its own frustrated need for power, and to do so within the constraints that the global technological system had first laid down. Paragraph 228 confirms this, as Kaczynski gives some general guidelines for identifying leftists, which, you may notice, don't actually have anything to do with ideology. Instead, as we find in paragraph 229, the tendency towards large-scale collectivism, the negation of individual freedom, a preference for more regulation for its own sake, an opposition to violence unless it's committed by leftist rioters, and a tendency to traffic in linguistifications ending in suffixes like ism or phobia without really understanding what any of these terms mean, all of these are traits of the leftists, not for any ideological reason, but rather because they enjoy a perfect structural isomorphism to modern technology itself. 
Paragraph 230, the final paragraph in this section, we find a cryptic discussion of something which Kaczynski calls the crypto-leftist. Now, the crypto-leftist differs from the overtly power-hungry type, who we learn in paragraph 224, will be favored by the laws of natural selection to seize power within the movement, rise to the top, and then override the intentions of the numerically more numerous, nicer types within the group. For this reason, though, the crypto leftist will be harder to identify because such a person will not rise up to a position of leadership within the movement, but will instead blend in with the rest of society and will probably even seem to the naked eye to be a model citizen. They'll be someone who holds down a good job owns a nice home, and raises a family of similarly over-socialized conformists. Interestingly, Kaczynski warns that the more dangerous type of leftist is arguably just such a person, for this is somebody who will not engage in any overtly aggressive behavior, but will instead work quietly and consistently in the background to transform society into the kind of one which modern technology needs. So, whereas an overtly aggressive leftist will attract attention and probably condemnation from many people within the public if they find violent actions like rioting, attacking police officers, or burning random buildings for leftist causes to be objectionable and scary, the crypto leftist will fly under the radar by instead implementing changes which actually seem on the surface level to be beneficial, but which are favored uh, by the global technological system simply because they are a means to an end to further collectivize the whole of society, which is another way of saying to further negate individual freedom. To cite Kaczynski's own example, the crypto leftists will uh, promote psychological techniques for socializing children, uh, as well as increasing their dependence on the system. Well, in our era, the crypto leftist might be thought of as the progressive Democrat Party voter within the upper middle class of society who holds down a high paying corporate job and understands that it is their ethical duty to waste $13 per ticket to take their kids to watch a stinker film like Disney's box office flop. Strange World, despite the fact that at this point Disney has openly admitted that it is no longer doing anything like entertainment. The point is not to actually watch a film with a storyline resembling anything like art in the proper sense of the term. Rather, the purpose of this is to indoctrinate one's own children at a high price monetarily from the earliest age possible to understand that what will be required of them for the rest of their life is gender fluidity, sexual consumerism, and of course, a willingness to waste their money on whatever corporate marketers told them they're supposed to want. However, Kaczynski is very careful to distinguish the crypto leftist from the ordinary bourgeois type, despite the Marxist tendency to confuse the two. This is because the ordinary bourgeois type is solely driven by economic interests. They may say that they are promoting ideology for its own sake, but they're really just trying to make money off of it in order to become better consumers or to advance their careers. It would be a mistake, however, to claim that the crypto leftist behavior is solely driven by such economically reductivist motives. In other words, Kaczynski very subtly disagrees with the Marxist claim that all of our actions are just superstructural distortions of underlying materialistic forces with an ultimately uh, economic nature. Rather, Kaczynski warns that the crypto leftist is motivated by the religious belief that the movement he or she is championing is right with a capital R. We learned earlier that this has a lot more to do with the psychological need to believe that someday one will get one's power and freedom back than anything to do with uh, economically reductivist motives. This makes sense when you realize that your average American suburbanite in the late 20th and early 21st century already has 
a higher standard of living than any ancient or medieval emperor, but are still unsatisfied with this level of material wealth, because they realize that what they need more of is not anything to do with the kind of economically reductivist motives which the Marxists would attribute to them, rather they realize that the only thing which can make them happy is getting back the freedom which they've sacrificed to the system. The religious belief in some utopian future brought about through progress, which gives them the, back the freedom which they sacrifice in the short term to bring that about, that's the only thing which can really explain their commitment to the movement. And this is exactly what makes the crypto leftist much more dangerous than the kind of bourgeois conformists which the Marxist critique will identify. is because the latter really are driven only by materialist greed, whereas um, the crypto-leftist is still acting within the paradigm of a religious true believer. In paragraphs 231 and 2, the manifesto finally comes to an end with a short section titled Final Note, in which Kaczynski admits that his approximation to the truth might be crude, to use his own term, at best, because of things like a lack of sufficient evidence and the necessity for brevity, considering this was originally published within a newspaper. But he affirms, nonetheless, in the final paragraph 232, that he thinks that modern leftism differs from past movements that seem to be concerned with similar issues like, say, championing the causes of the victimized, uh, by being defined more by the traits of powerlessness and feelings of inferiority than these past movements had been. This really does make sense when you consider, though, that the objective factor, which didn't exist in those pre-modern times, but completely defines modernity, is, of course, modern technology. This actually, therefore, confirms that the leftist is, in a certain sense, justified in feeling this resentment over this powerlessness, because modern technology really has made them as powerless as they feel themselves to be. So this will conclude our reading of the text once again. We will be dealing a lot more with Kaczynski's Letters from Prison, Unpublished Essays, and Revisiting Anti-Tech Revolution, Why and How, and all of this will be compiled and greatly expanded upon in an upcoming book titled Technological Crisis, A Reader's Guide to the Philosophy of the Unabomber. Thank you once again to everyone who supported the channel, and I look forward to further discussions.